Good evening and welcome to the Wheeler Centre's uh, live stream of the Fifth Estate. My name is Sally Warhaft. It's an absolute thrill tonight uh, to be here, uh, to be having a conversation with our 29th Prime Minister, uh, Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, it's a uh, uh, a pleasure uh, indeed. Malcolm Turnbull, of course, uh, was the leader of the Liberal Party, a former journalist, a lawyer and a businessman and, of course, an author of numerous books. But the one that uh, brings him to us tonight is A Bigger Picture. And uh, welcome, Citizen Turnbull. Thank you very much, Sally. It's uh, Citizen Sally. It's, uh, <laughs> it's great to be here. Um, and, of course, we're talking to you tonight from your... You're in your home uh, in Sydney. Everybody's sort of uh, locked in their houses at the moment. And I thought... I, I wanted to start there because um, in your book, uh, I noticed from beginning to end, actually, a, a theme of home. And it's quite uh, touching. Uh, it's surprising to me at times. Everybody knows, of course, that you decided to not move into Kirribilli House when you became Prime Minister, the Sydney residents, and you chose to stay in your, your own home. Um, you're probably the only citizen in Australia that would have, would have made that choice. Um, but you also kept on your father's farm after he died. You still have it. Um, you live today in your Sydney property around the corner uh, from a, a home you shared with your father as a child. And it just occurred to me that you have a very um, deep uh, and, and quite intense relationship to home. And I wondered if we could start off by you talking about that a little bit. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it goes even further than that. The uh, where we live is about 50 metres from where I was conceived, or so I'm almost certain, because we live um, on the eastern end of a little beach on Sydney Harbour called Lady Martin's Beach on Felix Bay. And uh, in uh, about, you know, 19, early 1954, my, uh, my mother had been a young actress and scriptwriter, screen, you know, a radio serial writer, uh, had been recently widowed and was living in an apartment belonging to her ex-husband, George Edwards, and was a, about to be kicked out of that. And uh, there was a handsome salesman living in a, uh, a basement apartment, basement flat nearby. The area wasn't quite as, as fashionable as it is today. And uh, he impressed her by pretending to be a porpoise and swimming up and down uh, in the water and uh, they uh, hooked up and I was the result. So, so I've, yeah, this is, I've, I'm very, I'm very connected uh, to this uh, particular neck of the woods, which of course I represented in parliament for uh, quite a long time too. Uh, the other house that of course features uh, in the book, uh, in some ways a, a star at times, is what uh, Kevin Rudd uh, uh, referred to as Chateau Despair, and that was uh, yes. Parliament House. Parliament House, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Tell us about your feelings about, about that particular house. You have some words to say about the architecture, but the feeling as somebody yeah. as somebody who's attached to the spaces that you, you dwell in, um, when, you, when you reflect on Parliament House, what do you feel? Well, the, well, you know, just before I get to Parliament House, there's quite a bit in the book about uh, the lodge and its history, and uh, and also about Kirribilli House. Um, there's a I've got a, a very deep interest in architecture and design, almost entirely learnt from Lucy, uh, who is a a great urbanist and understands these issues much better than me. And in fact, it was Lucy that first said to me that the problem with Parliament House, the new Parliament House, is that the form doesn't follow the function that actually frustrates it. Mm. Um, the old Parliament House, which you know we all know and, and Luce remembers, of course, from the days when her dad was a politician in the 60s, uh, was a much smaller place. And so the politicians inevitably bumped into each other and particularly uh, to get anywhere in the old Parliament House, they had to go across King's Hall. Uh, the new Parliament House, which was designed in the 70s and, and opened in 88, is a vast, monumental edifice and 
you know, even on a sitting day when there might be 3,000 people in the building, it, the corridors are for the most part empty. Uh, there isn't, you know, there is no natural meeting place or uh, place of conviviality or place where senators and members of the house hardly ever meet. Uh, it, and so it's, it, it does, it, the architecture actually frustrates the purpose of a parliament, which is surely to get people together to, you know, rub shoulders, meet, discuss, hopefully compromise and agree on something. It, it's so true, isn't it? And, and not just that bumping into each other, but with people on, you know, either side or wherever from the actual parliament, but also journalists, also um, the relatively, I suppose, normal people who work in the building and, and service it. And, mm. I mean, it seemed to me the the greatest charm of the new Parliament House was when we could walk on the roof. Uh, and uh, yeah, and even right. that and was it, that was taken away too in a in a real sign of um, the times back then uh, in the well, world. Well, it could have been worse actually. Abbott, uh, when I took over as Prime Minister, I managed to stop some of the uh, security plans. Some of them were too far gone to stop, but one of them involved having a literally a ditch like a moat around Parliament House. Um, which had, um, you know, which was missing, would have missed, it wasn't proposed to have water or crocodiles in it, but it was, you know, it would have turned the place into something like, an, you know, a citadel. Uh, it, it, it's interesting touching on that old Parliament House and, and what used to happen there, because it, it's something else I, I noticed, um, it, not just in your book, but but more in your your public life. All the other politicians I've watch particularly prime ministers uh, and 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 senior ministers you think of John Howard Paul Keating uh, there's a sort of visceral loathing of the other side um, you know it felt mm. always that you know John Howard just hates the Labor Party and Paul Keating mm. loathes the, the the Liberal Party and and everything it seems to stand for um, I, I I've never had that sense from you um, in fact, the sense I've had is that it's, it puzzles you. And I wonder if that's true. Um, and if, if at times you even uh, had to sort of manifest a, 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 bit, of, um, a bit of sort of loathing uh, uh, for the side. But, but it never really seemed to be present to me. Well, uh, look, I'm not, a, I'm not a hater. And I certainly... I'm not a very partisan person, which often displeases people in my own party. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 you know, when people say, oh, I hate the Tories or I hate the Labor Party, um, I, I think most Australians just it gives them the creeps. And it, it's crazy, you know, I mean, most, mostly it's famed, to be honest. Uh, I mean, when I, um, when I gave, um, you know, and I would sort of ferociously denounce Bill Shorten. There was one occasion where I memorably talked about him um, sucking up to billionaires in Melbourne in a rather ferocious speech that uh, everyone on my side loved. I mean, honestly, that is just theatre. And, and I, 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 never, I was never very comfortable with it because, it, um, because I'm not a, I don't, I'm not a tribal person, you know, and, and I mean, George Brandis has got quite a good, le a good letter in this book um, towards the end in which he basically says that was one of my weaknesses. I wasn't tribal. Um, I didn't think about politics in tribal terms. But I actually think it was more of a strength because the, you know, tribalism, factionalism, blind hatreds are really what's wrong with politics. I mean, there are so many people in politics that what gets them out of the out of bed in the morning is hatred and what they're against, as opposed to any positive vision of what they're for. So, you know, I, I, I've i really sought to get hatred out of my, um, you know, mind, uh, spirit, if you like, because I think hatred does more damage to the hater than the hated. So there's, there's a, you know, a self-interested reason, not just an altruistic one for not being a hater. It's been a, a remarkable thing of this particular moment in time uh, with the government's state and federal response 
uh, to the, the COVID-19 virus. Uh, watching that tribalism fall away um, and, a, and a subsequent uh, rise in the numbers, a remarkable rise in, in trust in government uh, and mm. allowing um, government to, to do things and make decisions that would have been unthinkable just a couple of months ago. Um, it, how do you look upon this as somebody where it, it could have been you leading um, during this mm. time? How do you feel about that? Well, I, look, I would, I would love to be still. I would still love to. I would love to be prime minister today, but uh, I'm not, obviously. Um, and you can't. No one's prime minister forever, um, and few people are prime minister for as long as they'd like to be. Uh, so most, as Keating once said, we most of we all get carried out uh, either by our colleagues or the electorate generally. Um, look, I think if if I was prime minister today the policies that I'd be following would be very similar to what uh, Scott Morrison is undertaking. I mean, the, the nature of the virus is compelling governments everywhere in the world to respond in broadly similar ways. You know, I mean, all pandemics, you know, going right back to ancient times have required social isolation in one form or another. Mm. I mean, the word quarantine mm is the Venetian, you know, 40 days uh, for the period that a ship with illness on it was obliged to be isolated and it's uh, until people were satisfied the, the um, ship's company had either recovered or died. Um, so, you know, social isolation, yes, that's kind of, that presents itself. Um, and the various uh, welfare measures, if that's the right term, you know, the wage subsidies and job keeper program and so forth are all emulated in most com countries around the world. So the the responses so far, I think just about anyone, any government would undertake this something very, very similar, right? The challenge now, the really hard bit is uh, how you get out of it. And also what are the longer term changes to the economy that are going to be caused by this, because this is not like simply putting the economy into hibernation and then you snap your fingers and it wakes up and everything goes back to normal. You know, just what we're doing now, Sally, I mean, just think about this. Um, so many of us have now realized in a way we didn't before how convenient it is, how efficient it is to socialize, interact, engage uh, remotely. And of course, you know, we've got uh, by and large ubiquitous broadband in Australia and in, you know, many other developed countries as well. We've got great applications, you know, all of the kit that enables us to do this. So what's that gonna mean uh, for the property market? What does that mean for office space? What does it mean for commercial space? What does it mean for retailers, hundreds of thousands of people? work in bricks and mortar retailing. I mean, you know, this has given online retailing a massive uh, lift. What's, so, you know, I'm, and there's plenty more things, travel, tourism, uh, foreign education. Uh, our third biggest export is education. How is that going to be impacted? So, you know, you can see, you can see a clearer way through to lifting the social distancing restrictions than you can to seeing what are the longer term um, uh, structural uh, changes to our economy and our way of life that this pandemic will have either brought on or accelerated. I mean, it's hard to imagine where government even begins in that endeavour. Uh, you know, the, the, the title of your book, A, a Bigger Picture, uh, We've lived for the past decades with such small picture politics. Um, any attempts at at doing large scale forward? I mean, look at climate change. Uh, just just for starters, mm. um, how does a government like the Australian government uh, suddenly snap into into a gear that enables these things uh, to be to be done? 
as well as it appears to be dealing with the health aspects of it? Mm. Well, I wouldn't entirely agree with you, Sally, about Australian governments. I mean, there is a, you know, there, most of the political commentary is utterly uninformed by any familiarity with the facts of what's actually going on in Canberra. It is all about personalities. It's about, it's race calling, often name calling, bluntly. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at the thing, the big picture uh, policy, just in terms of my own government, my own book, you know, the National Innovation and Science Agenda. I mean, that accelerated our innovation ecosystem in this country to the point where many people, for personally, I find I'm amazed by this, but many people in the business tell me our tech sector, our venture capital sector now rivals that of Israel. Now, that seems incredible to me, but, you know, I have friends and associates in that sector who, uh, you know, operate in, in Australia, the US, Israel and other countries. And really, again, there's a lot of detail about that in the book, and it's, 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 a, it's an interesting story how we really lifted that sector up. Look what we've done with building a defence industry in Australia. Look how we've taken on the whole challenge of storing electricity, you know, the big pumped hydro scheme, Snowy Hydro 2.0, under construction, the Battery of the Nation in Tasmania, getting very close to starting construction. You know, these are massive big picture uh, measures. And, you know, that's, that, that, you know, that required required and requires a big vision. Our whole international free trade agenda, again, against all of the odds and many headwinds, we managed to get that done. So, you know, when, when people say, oh, the governments haven't done anything, uh, I don't think they're, they're not only not being fair, they're generally uninformed. Mm, I, now, I, I certainly am not saying, I'm not saying that failure. you didn't do anything, of course. These are significant yeah. accomplishments, but, but when I mean the, the the biggest one and the most obvious one, of course, is climate change, and that no yeah, no yeah. matter what you strive to do um, until we have mm. uh, that policy and and that it's accepted with changes of government uh, as mm. a given, uh, how can we really talk about a, a, a really big picture? Well, it is it's a big theme in my book, and you know I. I track the 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 sorry history going back to 2007 when both John Howard and Kevin Rudd were proposing an emissions trading scheme and when Rupert Murdoch the great advocate for climate change denialism nowadays said we have to give the planet the benefit of the doubt you know there was a time when action to integrate climate and energy policy was actually bipartisan but Tony Abbott uh, you know, and others in the coalition destroyed that. Uh, that's I fought so hard to maintain it. That's why I lost the leadership the first time, I suppose. Um, and the, the the consequence is that here we are, this big continent, big, dry, hot continent, uh, so um, brutally exposed to the consequences of global warming, as we saw in the fires of last summer. Uh, and yet, we do not have a integrated uh, climate and energy policy. And the reason we don't is purely because of that toxic alliance of uh, right-wing politics in the coalition and the Liberal and National parties, the right-wing media, particularly the Murdoch media, and of course, vested interests in the fossil fuel lobby. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it, 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 and, and that combination, by the way, is, very similar to that in the United States. So here's the weird thing. In everywhere else in the world, pretty much, uh, people talk about global warming as a thing. It's a phenomenon. It's, a, it's physics, right? Uh, in Australia and the United States, you've still got people saying, I don't believe in global warming. Well, you don't hear people saying, I don't believe in gravity. Um, and uh, But there were people not so long ago, particularly in the same sort of right-wing ecosystem, who was saying they didn't believe that the COVID virus was real. Mm. That, it, you know, it's oh, it just a cold, you know, and now they're often the same people that are promoting all sorts of 
medical quackery. So there is a there is this anti-science thing going on in populist politics and media, and boy, it's dangerous. It's um, very dangerous. I, I think the word you use about the climate change politics in Australia is insoluble um, in the book. But I wonder, too, whether that may change, whether it may yeah. be something that can come out it's, of... It's the... not insoluble. That, that, that's, that, that's the councils of despair, that it's, yeah. it is soluble. Do you but, th but, but whether it will be solved, I don't, I, it's hard to say. Do you think that uh, the, the coronavirus, the emphasis suddenly, and much more in Australia than America, I think we're not comparable in, in some ways, thank goodness, um, in, in that here we are guided by experts, um, you know, the, the lunatics seem to have been uh, set aside in Australia mm -hmm. in terms yeah. of yeah. talking about this this terrible yeah. illness. Do you think that there's a chance that could influence uh, the climate change policy uh, in the near future? Well, Sally, I hope so. Uh, and I think in, in many ways um, the, the pandemic is a case of biology uh, mugging politics with reality. You know, the reality of sickness and death and massive economic disruption. Uh, climate change operates at a slower time scale, but not as slow as many people complacently imagine. Mm -hmm. And climate change is a case of physics mugging uh, or confronting uh, politics with reality. And, you know, you can... You know, you can carry on and negotiate in your political councils as much as you like, uh, but you can't negotiate with physics, as we saw in those fires. You know, all of the, and you know, all of the nonsense that you saw in so much of the Murdoch press trying to argue and media trying to argue that the fires were not the result of global warming; it was some arsonists. Remember that mm -hmm. whole campaign? Like it was an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. James Murdoch actually dissociated himself from it. He was mm. so embarrassed by it. Um, you know, at some point, you, you think that the penny is going to drop. Do you know, back in 2009, um, when I was opposition leader, and there's a bit in my book about this, I, I visited with Luce the uh, fire grounds after the Black Saturday fires. Mm. And just that, you know, the memories of that, have, I will never forget as long as I live, terror, you know, a terrible consequences of thousand degrees Celsius fires proceeding at a hundred kilometers an hour. You know, you, you as a Victorian would remember it very well. Indeed, I do. Um, and and, and I the thought, speech that you gave too, which is partly reproduced in the book. Yeah, and I, you know, and I, I thought then, surely, surely the reality of the consequence the physical reality, the brutal, murderous reality of the consequences of global warming are going to produce a change in the political sentiment, but they didn't. And even the fires of this summer have not yet produced that change. Because you see, if ever there's an opportunity now, what we need is a big green new deal. And when I say a new deal, I mean, harking back to Franklin Roosevelt's you know, big government investment program that pulled America out of the depression. And, you know, what we need to do now, both us here in Australia and the Americans in particular, is to really put a massive investment behind getting ahead of the energy challenge. You know, we have the opportunity to have um, cheap uh, emission, low emission, zero emissions, in fact, energy. You know, we, we could, we could, absolutely get to uh, net zero emissions by 2050 and indeed earlier. And if ever there was a time when we ought to bend the elbow and spend a bit more a bit sooner than we otherwise would, now is the time. Malcolm, if you could roll back time uh, to a point uh, in, your, in your political career uh, where you think perhaps... Uh, you might have been Prime Minister still today. Is there a moment that stands out clearly to you? Um, well, I mean, 
you know, in that last crazy week, there are a couple of moments. Um, I mean, if Morrison supporters hadn't voted tactically for Dutton in the ballot on the Tuesday, despite Scott saying he was supporting me, uh, then Dutton's coup would have, wouldn't have had critical mass, right? So you'd only take uh, it back that you know, far, just that far. You wouldn't, wouldn't wind back to say... Oh, yeah. Tony Abbott. No, well, I'm just saying, and then, and then, well, I'm just saying, and then, and then, if Corman had hadn't, you know, breathed life back into the Dutton exercise, then and essentially just decided to destroy the government, which is what he did uh, with his supporters, uh, we would have seen it off. Uh, but yeah, if you go back earlier, I mean, I think you know a lot of people have said you talk about Tony Abbott. What is your question about him? What is my question about Tony Abbott? Yeah, you yeah, about oh, well, yeah. I was I was just interested when I said that you know is there a, a moment you'd go back to and I mean I thought you you might have gone way back or um, uh, particularly to when he uh, uh, took the leadership by that one vote uh, oh, off yeah, you the sure. first oh, yeah, time round in two thousand and nine yeah two thousand and nine. Yeah, yeah, right. um, uh, you know how far back you go to 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 think of recarving uh, uh, the you know the political well trajectory. well Sally if if we had if I had won that ballot in two thousand and nine and the emissions trading scheme had been passed through the Senate which is what the coalition under my leadership had agreed to do then an emissions trading scheme would be part of our fiscal furniture about as controversial as the GST. It honestly, it would have, it, because business business basically wanted it passed. They wanted, you know, what business wants, the vast majority of people in business want to put a price on carbon, you know, and they, and they but they, they just want to know what the rules are. Uh, you know, the BHP has been arguing for this for years uh, and the obstacle has not been you know, the big end of town, you know, a conspiracy of top-hatted capitalists. Um, it is, uh, it has basically been this, this toxic, you know, uh, combination alliance that I referred to earlier. You, you, um, you go through so many moments uh, in the, in the book, obviously, of, uh, you know, troubling moments and, uh, all sorts of things that were thrown at you. The the Ute Gate story, uh, I found very moving. Your response to it and the the honesty. I I, I thought that the the Ute Gate and also your own um, uh, your battle with depression that you write about in the book, um, really really moving. And you talk about this um, this deep shame that you felt with Utegate um, and making, particularly having made a false accusation against Kevin Rudd and that it, it that you lost your faith in your political judgment because of that. Mm. What, what does it feel like to, to, to be Prime Minister uh, and to, or to, in that then Leader of the Opposition, to lose your political judgment? How do you even manage that? Well, well, I mean, whether I, there's some people that might have, might have said I'd lost my political judgment anyway, but no, but what I, I lost my confidence in it because I just thought to myself, this, how did I get taken in by this? Why was I so stupid as to deal with this guy? You know, why was I so, and I, and, I, and you know, I look, I, I just, I, I honestly, I was so appalled by myself. I was ashamed of myself. And, um, and what was, you know, interesting was that what I wanted to do, <laughs> which probably just as well I didn't, by the way, but what I wanted to do was to go into the House of Representatives and just apologise to Kevin on the spot and do a sort of mea culpa. Um, and my colleagues, I remember particularly uh, Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey and my, some of my staff were saying, don't do that for God's sake. I mean, Kevin said the most terrible things about John Howard and Alex Downer, which were all false. He accused them of corruption and many other things. And, uh, you know, never bothered to 
you know, qualify them or withdraw them or whatever. Uh, but I just felt so bad about it. And that, that literally within hours of my no longer being leader of the opposition, one of the first things I did was ring Kevin and apologise to him. Uh, and look, Kevin's an unusual fellow and, you know, we haven't always got on at all, quite the contrary, but in fact, we've often not got on. But, but I, you know, he didn't deserve to be, you know, well, no one deserves to have false accusations. People have made false accusations against me. I know what it's like. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I really felt bad about doing it. I, I thought it was interesting, Kevin Rudd's response to you apologising. He was sort of puzzled that you, you still cared, which actually he, says something about, about yeah, him well, too. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, people do fling a lot of dreadful uh, epithets around in politics. I mean, and, you know, comment is free. I mean, people can say, you know, you are, you know, government's hopeless, incompetent, whatever. But to actually accuse somebody of a factual thing, which is wrong, mm. that is bad. I mean, I, I, whether it's my journalistic background or my lawyerly background or both, I do take facts and accuracy seriously. And I try very hard, I've always tried very hard to get my facts straight. And, and which is often hard, by the way, as Prime Minister, because you're asked questions about every conceivable topic and you can't have every figure and number in your head. And so, you know, if I got a, a, a number or a fact wrong, uh, particularly in question time, particularly in the House, you know, I'd correct it. Mm. Uh, and and which is, which again, not a lot of people do, but uh, I just, um, you know, always... I mean, you, you just you, you just have to do that. You, you can't uh, if people you can't expect to get every number and every fact right all the time. Um, you you do seem to have a strange relationship to politics, uh, Malcolm. I, I I think too. Most people um, leave politics to overcome depression. Uh, you hear it all the time. People that are stepping down because. Um, well, mm. the, the, they usually say to spend more time with their families, but but just not being able to take it. There's more honesty, I think, nowadays um, about it. But um, you waded back into it. You reversed your decision to quit Wentworth yep. after you lost uh, the leadership to, to Abbott. And I, I wonder, has anyone ever in history uh, made a decision to... Uh, return to politics, to stay in politics, to regain their their mental equilibrium. I don't know, uh, Sally. I honestly don't know. Uh, but that that was that was absolutely the reason why I did it, and um, it was uh, it was like um, you know I was like I felt sometimes I felt like I was a a, a drowning man hanging on to you know a rope barely hanging on to a rope and that was that that still having that role uh in parliament which uh was what i i sort of used that to kind of pull myself back um and 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 you know frankly got my teeth into a very technocratic uh mission which was to work out how to uh you know, uh, fix up the, me the rapidly developing mess that was the Labor Party's approach to the NBN, uh, you know, which was, as, as I say in the book, it was very similar to the sort of reconstruction uh, work I'd done in business. Uh, I mean, Lucy and I had, um, you know, as we describe in the book, at one point we had um, worked with Cass O'Connor and Gary Rice and some others we'd worked on a plan and successfully restructure the 10 network. You know, so we'd done that. We'd, we'd done that. And actually, Luce and I had done a number of these together. So uh, that, you know, that enabled me to get my head into, out of political claptrap into engineering and costs and technologies. And, and that, that basically helped me get my equanimity back. Um, one of your notable triumphs uh, was, uh, of course, you, know, you were you were PM in the era of the rise of the strongmen around the world. Some really, really horrible uh, men, and 
you famously, uh, your first phone call with President Trump, uh, you won the, that. That yeah, there was a big row. Um, you mm. you you got your way on that uh, with the uh, refugee deal that had been made with President Obama, um, that had uh, really angered Trump. Um, you also managed to have a joint press conference with him without incident, which uh, is a rare feat as two, well. I think I had a couple. Two, was it a two, couple? Two, actually, with, you know, at least two, maybe three. Yeah. I, I want to run a quote um, by you from, from your book um, a, a, about, about Trump. You write, For all of Trump's so-called madness, in my own dealings with him, I have found him no less rational than many other billionaires I have worked with over the years. Um, I, I, I find that just terrifying uh, on so many levels, uh, Malcolm, that first yeah. of all, that most of the billionaires could actually be even less rational uh, than, than Trump. Um, but tell us a, a, a bit more uh, about what you mean, but unpack that quote for us. Well, what, 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 I, what I, obviously, I had a, you know, this huge row about the refugee deal, and which everyone's very familiar with because the transcript of the call was published not long after the call. Uh, and, you know, Trump was, you know, so angry and, and you know, he, he fi I finally persuaded him to stick with the deal against his better judgment. And he was really unhappy about having agreed. You know, he started off at no, he ended up at yes, and he didn't like that. Anyway, uh, sub subsequently, I dealt with him on a number of issues, but most particularly on trade. Because, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of um, problem issues with the United States, typically. The relationship is very close. Uh, it is a very deep. It doesn't just depend on the relationship between the Prime Minister and the President. I mean, that's important when there is a good relationship. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it's very deep. Yet, you know, commercial, military, intelligence, every level. So, but Trump was planning to put, and he did put tariffs on steel and aluminium imports into the United States and quotas as well. And I was determined that he not do that to Australia. Now, we are not big steel exporters to America or aluminium exporters at all. But for me, it was a matter of principle. And so I uh, had a, quite a long series of discussions with him and, you know, other and his Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin. And it's a very, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's an, it, it was an exercise in which Trump, came around to the point of view I was advocating because I was able to persuade him that not putting any tariffs or quotas on us was actually in America's best interest as well. So it was an exercise in advocacy, but it actually speaks well for him. I know this is contrary to perhaps his pattern of conduct and certainly contact, contrary to the stereotype, but in fact, he listened to me thoughtfully, uh, very thoughtfully, uh, he, he, he did listen and he was persuaded. And, you know, so I, I have to say that was a, a good, practical, rational uh, encounter. Now, you know, that's, that is one little window of my dealings with him, you know, of, 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 I'm sorry, of, of people's dealings with him. You know, he, he, was, uh, he was pretty wild about the refugees, but the rest of the engagement at times he was very you know he was actually quite funny really he uh, he developed uh, almost a, a sort of a I felt I was part of a routine when he he ended up making light of the refugee deal argument uh, as opposed to being offended by it. so he look he's a big big larger than life personality and a complex one uh, but I've described that that engagement there. And, and you know, Sally, from an Australian Prime Minister's point of view, the, the temptation and the pressure to just be a sycophantic doormat to the United States is very real. I mean, honestly, you know, the, the natural the reaction of, of many, many leaders and foreign leaders 
confronted with the magnificence of the imperial capital in Washington is to just, you know, be uh, in adoration. Uh, and that's what imperial capitals are designed to do. That's what Rome did. That's what Beijing da did and does. That's what, um, you know, uh, Byzantium did, you know, when the Byzantine emperors, you know, had, you know, those amazing court displays designed to awe and stupefy the barbarian guests. So the, the point is that in the imperial capital, they regard, and, and historically always have, they regard deference as their due. So if you go there and simply agree and suck up and flatter, that doesn't win, that doesn't win you any respect. It's not going to get you anything that they don't want to give you uh, because it's that, that's par for the course. So the challenge in dealing with great powers is to be strong, uh, to be courteous, that's always important, but to be, to above all, to be persuasive and to argue your case and argue it strongly and cogently. And, you know, I guess as an old lawyer, barrister, I said, you know, I'm not bad at, as an advocate uh, and I was able to do that. And to his credit, he listened. Uh, but it's um, the, uh, you know, the, the general approach to Trump was, uh, akin to Disraeli's advice on how to deal with royalty, you know. Uh, the flatterer is seldom interrupted and with royalty lay it on with a trowel. Mm -hmm. um, the, the remark you make about the, the billionaires, comparing him to other billionaires, you've, you've known a few. Um, is there something... I have moguls, I've had a few, yeah. Is there, <laughs> is there something about them that that, you know, we need to understand now that one of them is in charge of the United States? Well, look, having a billion dollars doesn't, you know, make you, um, uh, you know, a narcissistic bully. Uh, but a lot of people in that position tick that box, you know, and they become convinced of their... Um, they become convinced that they're smarter and better than everyone else. And they often believe that the norms that apply and laws and rules that apply to others do not apply to them, uh, which is a, a real worry. This is one of the things that Kerry Packer could not, because Kerry definitely believed that. And when the Costigan Royal Commission hit and suddenly he was being hauled up to give evidence and was being uh, falsely accused, you know, of some pretty, well, very serious crimes, he's accused of murder for heaven's sake, uh, and falsely. I mean, he could not believe that was happening to him. That was something that happened to other people. Um, you know, whether you're talking about Conrad Black or Jimmy Goldsmith or Bob Maxwell, um, you know, Rupert Murdoch, I've, I've known, you know, well, and we've had good times and bad times uh, to, um, you know, use Harry Evans' book title about Murdoch. Um, the I, Murdoch's not as colourful as, as, those, as many of those other big billionaires, but, but you know, I saw a lot of Packer in uh, Trump, a lot of um, Goldsmith and Bob Maxwell, you know, the big larger than life person who's always on show and basically believes that a combination of money, um, you know, frankly, bullshit and bravado will get them what they want. And, you know, bullying, bullshit and bravado, I suppose, you know, the three Bs uh, that are often very appealing to billionaires. And they, the problem that you have with people like that and politicians is that they want to own politicians. Uh, they like politicians who are deferential to them, who suck up to them. Uh, and, you know, as I say in the book, and it's quite a, I, I hope, it's, I put a lot of thought into it. There's a thoughtful analysis of the relationship of wealthy people to politics. Uh, but it is, you know, the, they, they love politicians that are dependent on them. Mm. And the more dependent, the better. And so, you know, that's um, the fact that I, to the very rich, the fact that I was, uh, had a business background and, you know, understood, you know, finance and business and, you know, was broadly speaking a, 
you know, a thoroughly free enterprise capitalistic person, that ticked a few boxes. But the fact that I was non-deferential, independent, um, <clears throat> you know, didn't always have my hand out, uh, that, you know, that, that was a mark against me. Who have, who's impressed you uh, in, in the world uh, leadership stakes in our recent times? Well, if you're talking about world leaders, mm. you know, national leaders, mm. um, I would say in our region, um, uh, Joko Widodo, President Widodo, I write a lot about him in the book, uh, Indonesia. Although uh, it's least... very unclear with the with the coronavirus, where the the, the big test this one isn't it? Uh, where the... well, it is, you know, and, and I mean, we just got to be very careful about. You know, we've seen how the wealthiest developed country in the world, the United States, has struggled to cope with it. Mm. You know, uh, how's Indonesia? You know, how a developed, you know, really developing country is going to cope? You know, with crowded living conditions and with hardly a, you know, a, a, a first world health system. But I'd say Joko, really, he is the hope of the side in many ways. Uh, uh, Lee Sien Lung, one of the wisest leaders in Singapore, Shinzo Abe uh, in Japan. Um, and then, you know, further afield, I mean, there, there are so many, but uh, uh, I, I hit it off very well with um, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France and the prime minister, Edouard Philippe. Uh, of course, Emmanuel uh, always has a special place in the heart of the Turnbull family, not simply because he gave me a very nice kayak, which was, I, uh, I enjoyed paddling, um, a, a timber kayak. Um, but he, um, he, more importantly, uh, when he was leaving Sydney, he, uh, he said, um, he, he said, uh, he said, uh, Malcolm, uh, thank you so much for your hospitality. And uh, thank you and your delicious wife, Lucy. <laughs> and uh, of course, of course, he. I mean, his English is great, right? I mean, my French, you know, my French when it was good was bad, <laughs> and now it's barely existent. But uh, of course, uh, delicieuse in French means delightful, and and of course, so we, that became a bit of a thing. And Lucy was uh, very pleased. She thought of the, you know, handsome forty-year-old president of France wants to call her delicious. That's that's fine. But he's a he's great, and Edward Philippe, the Prime Minister, is a, is a very outstanding leader. So France is very very lucky with those two young leaders, and of course, you know, in Europe, one of the wisest leaders of all is Angela Merkel, and she's a she's she's um, look anyone who's been in office for a long time makes a few mistakes, and she has too. But but you know what's interesting about Angela is she grew up in East Germany. And she understands uh, Putin and Russia better than anyone, I think, in Western Europe, better than it, because she really grew up in Eastern Europe, you see. Mm. And so she and uh, Putin are similar ages, and they were both in East Germany when the war came down. So they've got an interesting uh, backstory. Well, it's, it's, it's going to be fascinating to see how some of these careers end up you know given given what's come upon them i mean uh, obviously everybody's uh, governance is is going to be bookmarked by uh, up to coronavirus and beyond it isn't it and um seeing how mm. the world i mean can you can you see uh, a, a moment in the in the near future, the middle future, Malcolm, where the world might be open. And uh, I mean, this is as you write in the book. Australia is utterly dependent on free trade, on open markets, mm. on on openness. Yeah. Um, what what do you think will actually happen? Well, uh, the the pandemic will undoubtedly. Uh, fuel nativist, you know, protectionist sentiments. So uh, it will result in supply chains becoming shorter and they've been short, people have been shortening them anyway. So, you know, 
companies will want to make do more of their manufacturing closer to the home and closer to their markets. Uh, that um, that of course is being that that is being made more economically viable in uh, developed countries in higher wage countries because of automation. You know, a new a new factory, whatever it doesn't matter what you're making, whether it's sand shoes or motor cars, is going to employ a lot fewer people than one that was built 10 years ago, much fewer. Uh, so wage differentials become less important. I, I think the, the, you know, we've got, a, there's a lot to lose in terms of an open world uh, and really a, a lot for us to lose. You know, I mean, I know protectionism always gets a populist tick and the, the right of the Liberal Party uh, has plenty of people who see their real competition as Pauline Hanson rather than the Labor Party. But, you know, we, uh, trade means jobs. You know, one of the best things I was able to do as PM was keep the Trans-Pacific Partnership alive. That was quite a diplomatic coup. Uh, and also get the free trade agreements agreement uh, with um, Indonesia. And, you know, and there are other free trade deals we did too. And of course, in Abbott's day, there were free trade deals with China, Japan and South Korea. Uh, so there's been quite a trend of that. You know, we can't afford for that to get dialed back. Um, you know, equally, uh, you know, you look at uh, foreign edu you know, foreigners coming to Australia for education, foreign students, that's our third biggest export. Now, a lot of them have gone home. Uh, we need to make sure that they come back. Uh, so if people are reluctant to travel, if uh, we make it, you know, if our borders remain closed for too long, uh, that market will start to atrophy as well. Um, it's very interesting to hear you uh, uh, muse on these, these topics, uh, Malcolm, and it's, it was very, very interesting to read your book. Um, it's been a, a life, I sort of re reflected on your life and um, it, it's as if it's sort of so much of it has been covered in this sort of golden dust or something. I mean, you you know, you were the school captain and the um, this brilliant, uh, uh, you know, uni student who got a job on the, 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 the uni paper that led to a job at the Nation Review and went off to England and yeah. you give a speech, uh, you know, a debate speech. And I think Harry Evans, who you just mentioned, I think was in the room yeah. and, and here's it. He was, he was speaking, and, yeah. And calls you. Offered me a job on offered the spot. Offered you a job yeah. on the spot. Um, it, I mean, it really has mm. been a, um, a, a, there's been so many blessings in your life with, with your family mm. um, and, and so on. Um, that, that, that above all. Of of course, um, if if family is the above all, is politics the sort of muddiest for you? The the least clear in your? I mean, of course, you became prime minister. Um, there was almost an air of expectation uh, that you would from the moment you entered mm. uh, parliament, but it didn't go to plan. Um, it, does that feel like the the muddiest chapter of your life? Well, there, there, there actually there wasn't a plan in, in the sense this, I, I've never had a sense of uh, entitlement. Uh, I've never felt the world owes me a living. Uh, if you look at the things that I've achieved, with, you know, generally with Lucy, uh, we've had to fight for them. I mean, you know, the, the spy catcher trial was a huge victory and a life changing victory for us. But you know, the, the publisher only hired us because that, that the publisher was convinced the case was the biggest loser of all time and only agreed to hire us because we said we'd do the whole thing for $20,000 a year's work. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's how they, they thought it was a total loser. And, uh, and so, and, you know, we had a lot of odds there. I mean, I, I think uh, it wasn't the, you know, it was it was no small challenge for me to get into Parliament, and there've always been plenty of people seeking to, um, you know, uh, uh, stop me uh, doing achieving my goals. But also, I've had a lot of supporters too. Mm. You know, this is the the thing. Um, you've got to, um, you know, you, you 
you pick up, you pick, it's very easy to pick up a lot of enemies uh, and a lot of opponents, um, particularly in a competitive business like politics or indeed in business. I, you know, I had plenty of detractors when I was an investment banker. But equally, uh, if you've, you know, if you've got a bit of, if you've got some vision and you can set out what your objective is and, you know, you can build up confidence with others, then you'll get the support that you need. But, you know, it hasn't been, it hasn't, the, the I, I've ended up, I've ended up in some very good, successful places in my life, but it, it's often been a bit of a battle to get there, but that's good. I mean, I, 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 there's nothing worse than people that think that the world uh, owes them a living, because it doesn't. Mm. Um, well, you, you're in isolation now along with any, everybody else. You've already written your book, which, you know, I suppose if you'd known you could have written it in isolation. Uh, in isolation uh, what are you yeah. reading? What, well, authors what, are sort of in isolation all the time. Anyway. <laughs> what, what, yeah. what, what are you reading now that you've written the book? Uh, uh, I'm reading, I'm actually reading Jess Hill's, uh, oh. right now I'm reading Jess Hill's very good book about... Um, you know, domestic abuse. Indeed. Um, and you know, yeah, what, what, why did you make me do it? Yeah, it's and, very, very good work. Yeah. And look what you look what you made me do. Look what you made me do. That's uh, right. Jess, yeah. in fact, yeah. was a guest uh, at the Fifth Estate uh, last year and just won the Stella Prize and it is a, mm. a, yeah, well, a wonderful book. Um, oh, well, yeah. good. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, we couldn't do this in person, Uh and I hope that you come into Wheeler Centre sometime. I mean, an interesting thing when you, you write a book and you, you're meant to be going, you know, Sydney Writers' Festival is meant to open tonight, um, the Wheeler Centre here, all the things you do uh, if you're on a, on a book tour. But, of course, the most important thing you do when you're on a, on a book tour is actually meet your readers um, and yeah. you are missing out on that um, very magical and interesting experience uh, at the moment. So I hope that it, it's just on hold um, and in the future uh, some of them can bring all these books they've been snapping up and uh, you can write them notes in it and uh, enjoy yeah. some personal contact. But uh, it's it's really been really, really interesting to talk to you tonight and uh, I'm grateful and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see you around in person, I hope. You certainly will. I really look forward to coming back to the Wheeler Centre in Melbourne. It's a, it's a wonderful venue and uh, the whole cultural program that it undertakes is, uh, you know, one of the uh, many things that make Melbourne such a, a, you know, an amazing cultural community. Indeed it is. And uh, for anybody that uh, misses out on tonight, of course, it'll be up as a, a podcast by tomorrow morning, I think. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull, all the best. Uh, stay well, stay safe. And uh, we'll and speak you again. And all I'm... of our viewers. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, to good everybody, night. yeah, good night. And thanks for joining us this evening.